Good morning. Forgot to put this on. I apologize. So it is a pleasure to be here with everybody this morning. It's great to see everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to be able to stand uh, in front of you this morning and um, open the Word of God with you and study. Uh, and it was, we had a, a great class this morning. Bob, thank you for that class. And the parables of, of Jesus are um, just endless. So you can talk about them for, for hours. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's the beauty in them for sure. So if you, could, if you have a marker in your Bible, let's leave it to there in Matthew chapter 7. And this morning, it kind of coincides with, with our class a little bit this morning uh, on that parable. We're going to talk about judgment. And I'm not talking, in, it, judgment can go a few ways. And so we're going to kind of uh, focus on it a little bit. Um, and, and I'm really excited about it because I think that there are certain things when it comes to judgment uh, that kind of make people uneasy and can really be a point of strife between individuals, whether it be between Christian brother and sisters um, or between Christians and those of the world and how the world perceives us. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been called many things, and if you are um, familiar with having conversations with people about Scripture, and um, sometimes it can get a little uncomfortable, and sometimes you can get called names, right? Uh, you know, such as judgy pants. <laughs> you know, I feel when I when I hear of judgy pants, um, you know, I think I've probably got my judgy pants on today with my Corona 15 I've gained. So you know, that's you know, so that it it can be funny, but then it can also be hurtful, right? When people call you too legalistic, people say, "Well, you don't give grace." Right? And, and so we start to get attacked. And so what do we naturally do? We remove ourselves from that. We back away from that. When a brother or sister comes to us because they have a problem, are they actually going to come to us? Are we judging them for them judging us? Or is there a difference? Because everybody wants to say, well, you're not God. You can't judge me. And they're right. I'm not God. I was created by God. Therefore, I'm under him. But we can also notice that we have some obligation and really some opportunity to be a little judgmental, right? Or is that a bad word? You see, God's judgment involves salvation. If you look over in Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art in man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because... He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. So we can see in these verses that there will come a time when God judges. And that will involve your salvation. It will involve the actions. But us as man... It also involves salvation, does it not? If you look over in James chapter 5, in verse 19, it says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So is there some requirement of us to judge or to hold accountable? I would say so. And if anything, when we read this ver these verses, let him know he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude. There's, there's a beautiful opportunity there. And it does involve salvation. 
God's judgment will involve a man's heart. Over in Romans chapter 2, We read, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you will condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first, also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also for bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excluding them, and the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Can we do all that? That's not within us. So there becomes a difference, a vast difference between the two different types of judgment, the judgment of God and the judgment of man. Man's judgment, we can't judge an individual's heart. I don't know your motives. I don't have that ESPN where I can think about what you're thinking about or know what you're thinking about or, or look into your heart. I don't have that x-ray vision, right? I can't see what's inside you. But if we look over in Matthew chapter 7, and starting in verse 15, here we can see what we're asked to judge. Because it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I, knew, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We won't have the opportunity to tell somebody that what they're doing and what their motives are in their heart are wrong unless we can do what? Bring it back to the scriptures. Unless we can tell them the fruit that you're bearing is bad fruit, and here is why. Because what's important to remember is that everybody will answer to them, answer to God, excuse me. Everybody will answer to God. So that's where man's judgment and the reason why we should care enough should come into play. So when someone says, you can't judge me, we can say you're right. But if you look over in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 10, it says that at that name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and on those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the God and Father. Because that's why it's important. Because it will come a time 
when God judges you. And so man's judgment has to start from where? We have to answer for ourselves, for our actions. Matthew 7, starting in verse 24. It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and, did not, and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. Is that house a fruit? Is the labor that was done there a fruit that that individual was bearing, that that tree was bearing? It absolutely was. But we see in verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, therefore does not make this fruit, does not bear this fruit, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and it was a great fall. So we can start to see how these two types of judgment, God's judgment and man's judgment, come together, and they intersect a little bit. But with God's judgment, none of that is within man. That is outside of our scope of practice, outside of our capabilities. But what's interesting is the judgment we can have and are to have for ourselves and for each other is something that we are charged with. It's something we are going to be held accountable. We read in, in James that if we can tell somebody about their fruit or the lack thereof or the issues or, quote, pass judgment, be Mr. Judgy Pants, that that's good if we can bring a brother or sister back. But there's a problem, we ha there's, there's an obstacle in the way. And what is this obstacle? It's the stigma, right? When, I, when, when someone says, well, why are, you can't judge me. That word judge and judgment, it's just kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? Usually because there's a level of accountability. And when someone says, well, how can you judge me for what I'm doing? Look at you. You could say, you're right. Look at me. Help me. Well, what makes you think that you're smarter than me? What makes you think that, that you know what's right and what's wrong? Who put you in charge? You know what? That is a great question. Man, you talk about a door that swung wide open. But how many times have we just went, I don't want to talk anymore. I want to be done. I want to walk away. You know, I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with this conversation. Instead of looking that, at that as a negative, look at that as a positive. Now you've really struck a chord. Now you have an opportunity to say, you know what? You're right. Where do we get right and wrong? By which, by which measure are we going to be measured by? Which ruler is going to be used to measure us? Because it is not me, it's God. You see, when I wanted to become a firefighter, what, I had to do, what did I have to do? I had to go to class and read a book. If you want to learn how to, how to, how to do algebra, for some reason, you got an algebra book, right? If you want to learn how to perform heart surgery, you have to go read it and learn it. And be instructed in it. And then go practice it. So you know what? You're right. I don't know what's right and wrong. Let's figure out where right and wrong comes from. Matthew 7. It says, judge not that you not be judged. See, you can't judge me. You know what? You're right. But here's what I can do. I can say that the word of God says this. And it has said this, insert verse, for a very very long time. Verse 2, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That should make you a little tight in the collar, right? 
here I am talking to you about your lack of attendance or the jokes that you're telling or the way that you've treated me. I'm in front of you talking to you about something that you're doing wrong. And so what, what's always said? The finger's always pointed back, right? Verse 3, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove your speck from your eye, yet look, the plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So we can see here we both have problems, right? We can see here that if we can use the same unit of measure, I'm going to first try and look at myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge my own heart. I'm going to judge the words that I'm going to use to talk to you. And I'm going to evaluate those things first. Does it mean you can't go talk to your brother? No, we're charged to do that. But just understand that you need to recognize the frame of mind that you're in to help that. And what's interesting is, is we can be very judgmental. As I pause and I reflect and I think about the plank that's in my eye, I'm asking, why am I so judgmental about something? Why, why am I such, where did that come from? And so I ask the question, is it a learned habit? When's the last time you saw a little, you know, two-year-old say, Mom, whatever you're wearing is not working. <laughs> Why is it that every time we hear a child's laugh, I mean, how many videos have you watched of kids just laughing for whatever reason it is, and it just brings a smile to your face? What child is naturally born with a frown on their face and not full of joy and light and life and spirit and love and forgiveness? But as they get older, what happens? They start to fall away from that. So is this judgy pants? Is this judgmental individual? Is this hypocrite a learned thing? Jesus said, Matthew 18, 3, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted to become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself. So we can see here that as you grow up, what do you get? Full of pride, full of self. And we talked about it this morning in class. It doesn't need to be there. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Why did he say that? It's something to look at. Because as we, as we live our lives, as we try to talk to other people, our heart and the mindset that we continually live with, that we portray to our coworkers, to our families, to our friends, to, to everybody in this world, whether you're just walking down the street. You ever walk down the street and notice somebody just smiling? Smile at You've never seen them in your life before. You're just like, what was that guy so happy about? It's raining right now. <laughs> be that person. And it's okay to be. And even if you have to fake it until you make it, put a smile on. Because our heart and mindset will determine our perception, not only of, of individual people or of groups of people, but the perception that others have of us. If we are full of life and we are letting our light shine as we're supposed to be doing, the power of observation is exponential. How many times have you gone to work and seen somebody over and over and over and like five years later, your coworker's like, you know, there's just something different about you. What's so different about you? You know, I, I, I pass you each day in the hall, and I don't know you very well, but you've always got a smile on your face. You always have something nice to say. You always say hello to me. The price of that was free, and now what's happened? Now you've started. The door's open for a conversation. I've got Christ living in me. However you want to start it. I have, I have everlasting life to look forward to. You see how easy that was? 
And it's all because we are being judged each and every day. And we're to judge ourselves each and every day. And so it's important for us to reflect this morning and ask the question, how can we, how can I change the stigma and make that word that just kind of something that we can look forward to? It's pretty easy, I think. Most things are easier said than done, right? (laughs) But if each day we charge ourselves to say, you know what? I'm going to take care of this plank. Could you imagine if we all walked around like this? Because we can't put like a piece of wood in our eye, right? If we literally walked around like this as a daily reminder, it'd be kind of silly. But does it help with our evaluation? Does it help with our reminder How can we start each day reflecting on our own plank? Maybe it's an app on your phone. Maybe the first thing you do when you set your alarm off, when you shut your alarm off for the third time, you open up your Bible app. Maybe the first thing you do is you walk downstairs and you start the coffee pot. What's sitting right next to the coffee pot? A Bible. Read a chapter. Read a few verses. Grab a devotional book. Start your day off on the right note. It can't be bad. If you're reading the word of God that's living, that's true, you can't start a day off bad. So that's a start. We can study. It's so important to do. And and in setting ourselves up for that, you know, I I am not, um, I'm not a reader. I've, I've never really been a good reader. In fact, I think Knox has probably read more books in his little life than I've read in my entire life. <laughs> and that probably includes all the little articles <laughs> and uh, editorial discussions on social media uh, that, are, that are out there. And so it's hard for me, but I had to start somewhere. And we have to start somewhere. We have to get ourselves ready to be judged. And to reflect on ourselves, if you turn over to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, which, in being baptized, I have been raised with Christ, right? We seek those things which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. It's that simple. If we have been raised with Christ and we are truly seeking those things that are from above, all we got to do is set our mind there. Pray, take heed, warn yourself, be humble, remove self from self-help. The United States of America is number one worldwide for self-help books, seminars, pills, (laughs) name it. We are number one. It's, it's an industry that it produces millions of dollars a year and could easily be ended if we take the self out of self-help and put God first. Help God by preaching to others. Help others by treating them the way we are supposed to, by loving our neighbors It's important, and what's crazy is it's just that easy. Because in Matthew 6, verse 21, we read, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so as we are starting our day, Monday, right? Let's all charge ourselves to do that. Tomorrow, we're going to wake up, we're going to start a reading plan. We're going to wake up, we're going to go to the book of Acts, we're going to go to Matthew, we're going to pick one. And just start tomorrow. And as we're doing that, and as we're progressing through our day, we're going to be more aware of our verbal and nonverbal communication. It's like a 90-10 split, right? How many times has someone has someone said, hey, I'm I'm really sorry. That I hear what you're saying. I don't I don't see it. 
How many times has somebody walked by us and we kind of gave them the whole like, woo, pass a little judgmental, nonverbal communication as they walked by? Our body language. This nonverbal communication is, is, is key. And it's something that we need to be aware of and is important to be aware of because it's how others are perceiving us. If our heart is right, if our mind are set on higher things, on holier things, it will help us. And in James, if you want to turn over to James chapter 3, we can read about how strong and powerful our tongue is. My brethren, not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot decides. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little, a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire in the world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. If our tongue is not tameable, does that mean we don't try and tame it at all? No, absolutely not. That means that every day we have to be aware of it. Every day we have to practice taming that tongue. And it is a whole lot easier to do it if your minds are set on higher things. If your heart is seeking God. And if our fruits are speaking louder than our words. It's three easy steps for us to, to shake this stigma. And it is so very, very important for us to be aware of it. Because not only will it help us to acknowledge the fact that judgment is a necessity, it will allow us the, the opportunity to take this word that, that, that has this negative stigma around it and use it in a positive way, in a way that we can go out and preach the gospel to others and plant the seeds and work in the fields that we are supposed to so that we can bear these good fruits because I don't want to be burned by fire. I don't want to spend everlasting life and eternity in hell. I have no desire to do that whatsoever. Romans chapter 14. Let's turn over to there. Romans 14 is, very, is, a, is a very, very interesting chapter. It talks about judgment. And in this time, there was a lot going on. There was clean food, and there was unclean food. There's a lot of tussling over it. You can't judge me for what I eat. And how many times do we hear that? You can't judge me for what I wear. You can't judge me for what I do. You can't judge me. Okay. But let's look at Romans chapter 14 and see what we can take from that. It says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one, one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he who gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat 
and give God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and live again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account to him, of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue things which make for peace and things by which one may edify one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. This chapter shows us that just because you might not like what somebody does, the question is, is it a matter of salvation? You might not agree with the car somebody drives or with the shoes somebody wears or with the hair somebody has. Is it a matter of salvation? Are you going to run them off because they don't meet your standard? Are you going to cause them to sin and to fall away because they don't fit inside of your box? Let it not be. Let us look to one another in love and in grace and with each other first. Let us have the heart that God wants us to have. Let us be that shining light that he wants us to be. And next time somebody says, well, you can't judge me, you can tell them, no, but God has called me to be a watchman. God has called me to read his word. He has called me to hear his word. He has called all of us to believe in him. So therefore, I seek a higher calling, and I want you to as well. And that's why it's so easy to look at the scripture, to understand what we have to do to be saved, to be able to seek that eternal life, to hear the word of God, to believe in him, and to repent. How beautiful of an opportunity to be able to repent. You know what? You were right. You came to me. You told me I was out of line. I've been slacking off. You called me out on it. I'm not going to tell you about the plank that you got sticking out of your eye while you're coming trying to talk to me. <laughs> because why? Because if my heart is right, I am so thankful to you that you cared enough, that you loved enough to come to me. You were loving me, not judging me. So thank you. Because with that repentance, with that confession, and with that baptism, we should all be able to spend an eternity in heaven together but it takes all of us to get each one of us there. So this week I charge you, focus on your plank. Open your Bible up and read. Start your day off right. Set your mind on things above. Take the self out of self-help. 
Look to others. How can we serve others? How can we talk to others about the salvation that we have and the hope of eternity we have? If there's anything we can do for you, please come forward as we stand and sing.